there is a devastating disease that hits. There is a devastating disease that hits young boys. It destroys the brain and there is no cure. They started saying that they couldn't do anything. And I was just like, well, are you thinking okay? So what do you do about it and how do you make it better? Oh Incredibly, one father, desperate to save his son, found a treatment. It's a love story, you know, the love of my child. His triumph became a Hollywood movie, Lorenzo's Oil. But doctors questioned whether the so-called miracle cure had any effect at all. Now, with new evidence, we can reveal the truth behind this extraordinary medicine. Alex Hunt is 10 years old and suffers from ALD, a rare genetic illness. Now, can you open your mouth, please? The disease has left him blind, paralysed and unable to speak. Good boy. All right, now we'll get a cloth and wash your face, yeah? Let me lay you down a bit more. Go for it. ALD strikes without warning. Just three years ago, Alex was a normal, healthy boy. <laughs> he was really active, like running around all the time. He was really quite good athletically, loved his football and stuff. Just really bright and happy and just lovely. Really, really fun. He was very popular, enjoyed life at school, loved his maths. And that's when I first knew Alex. But very quickly, I was called to look at Alex because things were beginning to change. And we began to be very worried about Alex. We had a few, like, behavioural problems, which you just put down to attention-seeking, you know, like, tidy up your room, no. And it was just sort of like weird stuff, like just really, really shouting at him to do stuff and he wouldn't do it. And it's, it was just not like him. Whoa! What are you doing down there, Alex? What are you doing down there? Are you cheeky little man. <laughs> they used to go swimming every week and his swimming kit would always be on his peg and he'd never be able to find it. And he was just there on his peg, but he just, he just couldn't find it. The children go up to a canteen and they collect their lunch. And then they sit down in a chair that's very obvious. Alex was found to be not able to understand that routine. Having done it for three years, he couldn't find the chair, so the ladies would have to show him which was the chair, even though he was following a line. And daily, the tray tilted more and more, until one day he, the food slid right off and he was very, very upset. By this time, Alex is walking into walls and stuff like this, and his hand-eye coordination was starting to go. He couldn't write properly, um, make a real mess of himself eating his dinner and stuff, because it was... I'm missing his mouth and stuff like that. What's your mouth for? Uh, chips. Chips? Yeah. So we went to see the woman at King's College and she referred us to Guy's Hospital where he went for an MRI scan and that was it. That's when we knew what he had. They started going on about, oh, this is damaged white matter in the brain. And they told me, like, the name of the disorder, this is adrenal dystrophy. And, um, and then they started saying that they couldn't do anything. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, she's sitting there and you're thinking, OK, so he's got this, so what do you do about it and how do you make it better? You're not taking over! Huh? You're not dystrophy, ALD, attacks the brain. It progresses very rapidly. Within weeks, 
Alex's eyesight and coordination were failing. You got the wrong mic, honey. Let me help. Huh? Let me help. Am I in the wrong way? Are you got the wrong mic? Huh? You got the wrong mic. There was no treatment and no cure. earlier in the United States, another little boy, Lorenzo Odoni, had been showing the same strange symptoms. A neurologist's diagnosis was about to shatter the lives of his parents, Michaela and Augusto. He told us the news. I mean, he told us what he thought Lorenzo had. And that's the first time that we heard the word adrenoleucodystrophy. I was just Terrorized. I mean, I was shocked. Well, I said, my bee is right, but uh, I, I want to see it myself. I mean, you know, so, yeah, it was a death sentence. I mean, I asked him uh, if he could uh, give me some reference of articles published on, on the disease. He said, well, first of all, there are very few articles on it. And, but don't, don't, don't bother, because even if you find some, you will not understand them. I said, well, I mean, we shall see about that. With their son's life at stake, the Odonis felt compelled to act. They had no scientific training, but both were highly educated. Michaela, a linguist, and Augusto, an economist and they just happened to live five minutes away from the biggest health library in the world. I found many, many articles, and so I start to learn about this uh, bloody disease. What he learnt was shattering. The disease only affected boys, and the outlook for his son was horrifying. The experts could offer no hope. There was one, it was the classic study on adrenoleucodystrophy by a doctor called Schumbert. He described very accurately the development of the disease in nine boys. And it was so, so grim. I mean, that really, um, we wanted to cry <laughs> reading this thing. I mean, it was so... Hopeless. It was uh, something that was rapidly progressive, deprived the boys of all functions, and then the boy died at the end. Augusto's daughter from his first marriage, Christina, flew in from Italy, where she'd been studying. My father was very sweetly trying to protect us from knowing the full tragedy. And then I remember arriving at the airport in Washington, and... My father, who had been this very strong, big, black-haired man, you know, I was looking, I was scouring the people there to find him, and I couldn't see him. And suddenly, I saw this man who was bowed over like an old man and with white hair. And I just, I looked in shock, and, and that was my father. And, and then I realized something very, very big had happened. And on the drive home, my father told me, you know, the truth and the di diagnosis. And it was just, it was terrible. But Augusto and Michaela were not prepared to give up. With no scientific training, they decided to take on the huge task of finding a cure for ALD. These parents decided that they would make a difference, that they were not going to sit back and accept the doctor's verdict, which was, Go home, pray if you believe, and your son will be gone within a year. One of the important features of my father's character is this extraordinary stubbornness. And he was absolutely convinced that he could do this. Nobody else had done it before. Everybody was, you know, very skeptical about the possibility of a layman coming up with a scientific solution 
to a medical problem. But he was not going to let that deter him. It's a love story, you know, the love of my child. I didn't want to see my own flesh gone down the drain. And in the meantime, you know, he had lost functions. And so we were racing against the clock. The race to find a cure took them to Baltimore to visit Dr. Hugo Moser, the world expert on adrenoleukodystrophy. I always remember he started by saying, oh, isn't it a nice day? Because, in fact, the weather was very nice. And then he corrected himself, oh, but not so good, not so good. Yeah. They had already done a good deal of their homework uh, before they came. So I think most of the things that were published, uh, they were already familiar with. Huh? So they ask very good questions. At the time, very little was known about ALD. But Dr. Moser explained that the terrible brain damage seemed to be caused by a buildup of particular fats in the blood, known as very long chain fatty acids. It was the clue the Odonis were waiting for. With Lorenzo rapidly deteriorating, they returned to the library to learn everything they could about these fatty acids. Some families take a very great personal interest in the Odonis uh, certainly were uh, at the far end of that spectrum. They did it very systematically with great intelligence and also with the tremendous know-how how to be effective. Working day and night, the Odonis began to piece together what little was known about this terrible disease. We started calling doctors all over the world, France, even Japan. And uh, I could see that those doctors didn't know of each other. So we decided to bring them together. And so we organized the first international symposium on adrenoleukodystrophy. While the Odonis hurried the doctors to Washington, Lorenzo was getting worse. He couldn't even join his friends on the football pitch. He wanted to participate. And he was trying, and every time he tried, he would fall because his feet would bend. And he cried, and he cried, and he cried. And so I took him in my arm and, you know, tried to console him as much as I could. His speech had deteriorated to the extent where I could no longer even pr pretend that I understood the sounds. To have a brilliant, articulate, trilingual child making sounds that not even mummy could understand was, was more anguishing than anyone can possibly imagine. As winter set in, just six months after diagnosis, Lorenzo needed full-time care. His parents were working round the clock organizing the symposium, and they decided to bring over a family friend from a happier time. Umari had known Lorenzo before he was ill, when the family had lived in the Comoros Islands off East Africa. He was just such a, a nice little boy hanging around, very, you know, bubbly and uh, nice and cheerful and a joy to be around with. And then I got, I became friends with him. We would just play after school. I would take him swimming, I would take him walking around in my village. You know, it was a holiday atmosphere. We would take him out to the beach. We, um, I taught him swimming. It's not uh, that big a place. There isn't much to do except to swimming and climbing trees and chasing after goats and just hanging around in the beach. Lorenzo's idyllic childhood ended abruptly. His father was called back to Washington with the World Bank and he became ill. Umari followed only nine months later. It didn't take me too long to realize that Lorenzo was seriously ill. I thought they needed someone whom Lorenzo knew before he became sick to keep him company, to talk to him, to entertain him. Um, and also to be there 
in case they need some help, someone familiar with Lorenzo. And that's what I believed they wanted of me. And I was more than willing to provide that. Desperate for a cure, Augusto and Michaela were pinning their hopes on the symposium. Amazingly, they had persuaded all the ALD specialists in the world to attend. At the meeting, it became clear that the secret lay in getting rid of the very long chain fatty acids that seemed to cause the devastating brain damage in ALD patients. At uh, the meeting, I mean, there were many ideas tossed around, but rather inconclusive, except that one of the doctors had found out that oleic acid was doing something. Dr. Rizzo had discovered a vital clue, an oil, oleic acid, seemed to be having an effect. We were trying to alter the fatty acid levels that are accumulated in this disease, and we found that oleic acid had a beneficial effect in lowering levels of uh, the offending fatty acids. It was a tantalizing breakthrough, but there was a snag. These experimental studies had only been done in the laboratory. Oleic acid had never been tested on humans or produced in an edible form. But the Adonis weren't going to let that deter them. The very next morning, I went down to the local library, made a list of all the companies in this country manufacturing oils of any type, and began systematically bringing them up to see if they had oleic acid. There were probably 40 or 45 companies that I called. On the first round, um, only one company would even talk to me. And then I began ringing back all the companies who hadn't returned the call. That took a lot of persuading. Drug manufacturers producing the oil, and that's, uh, they were extremely uh, skillful at that. Eventually, one company called back and agreed to send Michaela a sample of oleic acid. This was going to be the first human trial. We gave this stuff to Lorenzo, then uh, the very long chain fatty acid were, were reduced. By how much? By 50%. It was a scientific breakthrough, but it was not enough. Only half the damaging fats had gone. By now, Lorenzo was almost totally paralyzed and could no longer speak. The situation was critical, and time was running out. One of the first things that you noticed if you walked into the house was the tension. It was a life and death matter, and anything in this household could trigger off a, a, a calamity, could trigger off a death. And so that you felt as if you were forever walking on eggshells. I pictured the ALD like a serpent, a snake who was trying to choke my child. And I had to kill the, the, the snake. Because oleic acid had partially worked, Augusto thought the secret lay in combining it with a second oil. But finding the right combination seemed a mammoth task. I said, what about if we give him uh, another fatty acid, if we combine oleic acid with something else of the same family? Perhaps there would be a compound effect. But then I had to establish which other fatty acid I could combine with oleic acid. I had told my wife the night before, if I had a computer, I could figure it out. Whilst caring for Lorenzo during the night, the answer suddenly hit him. When I came uh, down for breakfast, I told my wife, I figured it out. So she said, oh, bravo, Augusto, even without the computer. This was Augusto's triumph. He had brilliantly identified the only obtainable substance that would combine with oleic acid to give a stronger effect. This was a rusic acid, but it would cause such outrage he would be plunged deep into conflict with the medical establishment. Everyone was telling me, are you crazy to give a risic acid to, to children, to Lorenzo? And I said, well, why? Why not? They said, because a risic acid is very bad for the heart. I was worried for two reasons. 
One that uh, was evidence in the literature that it could cause heart disease. And the second part is that I was concerned that patients with ALD could not handle it in the same way that normal people do. But with no other option, Augusto had to keep trying. Being skeptical, as usual, I said, what do those guys know about the uric acid? After all, they are clinician or research doctor. And I, so let me find out who are really specialists. And I found out that there were three guys that had spent most of their life on uric acid. The French one was uh, wishy-washy. One in Canada was absolutely obtuse. But the third one in Canada, he got me right, uh, right away. I mean, he got... What did he say to you? He said, Mr. O'Donnell, don't you believe for a moment that uricic acid is dangerous in people? It is dangerous in rats, but not in people. So and I said, that? well, can you give me some ev evidence of that? And he said, oh, it just happened that I wrote a book. That was enough for Augusto, and he decided to try out erucic acid. But first, he had to get hold of it. It meant another battle with the drug companies, but this time it would be harder. The substance he sought was still widely regarded as toxic. I tried in America, and again, uh, many, many, uh, Michael and I called uh, all those firms, and they said, are you crazy? We don't want to touch. We don't want to have anything to do with it. Oh, man. Um, sometimes you would think that the next day there won't be any telephone left in the house. They'll be all broken <laughs> because um, he would always get mad. While Augusto was battling with scientists in the hunt for erucic acid, Lorenzo's illness was taking its toll on Michaela. Michaela was a different creature. She had completely changed from one sweet lady to a very tough one. And she could not bear to see Lorenzo suffer. So if a nurse made a mistake that could make Lorenzo sicker or suffer at all, uh, she was out of the door right away. There was no negotiation, there is no second chance. The Odonis refused to give up. Finally, their persistence paid off. A company on the other side of the Atlantic were prepared to distill erucic acid. Croda in Hull asked their most experienced technician to take on this difficult task. I remember the excitement when my father discovered Mr. Sudderby because, you know, he was this man who nobody had ever met in a town my father didn't even know the existence of, Hull, and um, all the way across the Atlantic. And yet he'd been so moved by this story that, you know, he was prepared to dedicate every working hour to the cause. After six months, he sent us the first liter of erucic acid. We mixed it with the oleic acid, which we already had, and Lorenzo Sol was born. At last, the chance for a cure was in their hands. But would the oil work, and would it be safe? It was too risky to test the oil on Lorenzo, but Michaela's sister, Deirdre, also carried the ALD gene, and had very long chain fats in her blood. She volunteered to take part in this risky experiment. Jokingly, we called the herm our favorite rat. With no time to go through proper drug testing procedures, the Odoni's potentially dangerous decision was one doctors could never have taken. We were concerned that a damaged heart and would be toxic. If I had given erucic acid to his sister-in-law, I would have had to have approval from an institutional review board with very tight controls. Free from these constraints, Augusto prepared a meal for Deirdre using Lorenzo's oil. 
They carefully monitored Deirdre's heart and saw no problems. They sent her blood samples away for testing. The results were startling. In Deirdre, after a few days, the serpent was killed. <laughs> yes, and no more very long chain fatty acid, no more harmful fatty fats. And so I gave it to Lorenzo immediately. In just two weeks, the damaging fats were also gone from Lorenzo's blood. Then when I got the results, I was very, very excited. I was very pleased. I wrote a paper and sent it to all doctors. Augusto and Michaela had succeeded where medical science had failed. Soon word of their amazing story began to spread across the world. It even caught the eye of a Hollywood filmmaker. I remember the director, George Miller, ringing up from Australia and saying to my dad, I just love this story. I was a doctor myself, and, you know, this is a tremendous uh, triumph of the will. And my father, again, you know, it was, it was a, a vindication. But with no scientific proof, the medical world was skeptical. Only one doctor kept an open mind, Dr. Moser. He realized that the Odoni's results were significant. Lorenzo oil lowers these fatty acids more effectively and more quickly than any other uh, uh, medical approach that's been used. <laughs> it would be absolutely foolish not to give that approach a very serious consideration. Dr. Moser immediately started to treat ALD patients with the oil. For one family in Essex, it came at a critical time. I had Barry, and then 18 months later I had Glenn. I just wanted them to just enjoy their life, really, and just be happy kids, which they were. The Stafford's happy world was shattered when their eldest son, Barry, was diagnosed with ALD, aged seven. It felt like the world had just collapsed. Everything had just gone down the drain. Um, we had no feeling at all. Alfie, my husband then, was devastated, obviously, as indeed I was, but wasn't prepared to let this one go, and asked if there was anywhere in the world we could go that would know anything about the illness. And he did say that America uh, was doing a little bit. I phoned up Professor Moser, and he said, well, when can you get Barry out there? When the Staffords arrived in America with Barry, Dr. Moser was able to offer them something really positive. He did say that Lorenzo's oil is being tested on symptomatic children, but it hasn't been clinically tested right at, at, at that time, because I think it has only just been brought out. And they asked if Barry could go on to it. I personally felt that it was a chance Maybe it may stop things with Barry. I think we were still all still in shock, to be quite honest, and I think we were just grasping at straws. We would try anything. I don't think it was a difficult decision because the way they explained to us at the time, it was getting rid of the damaging factors, so we put him straight onto it. Dr Moser was putting every diagnosed child onto the oil. In all of them, the very long-chain fatty acids were reduced. Because ALD is a genetic disease, there was a chance that Barry's younger brother, Glenn, might also have inherited it. This time I've done a belly flop again. <laughs> he was showing no symptoms, but aged only five, he hadn't reached the critical stage. The Staffords waited anxiously for Glenn's test results. And I just looked out in the corridor and I saw Dr Moser coming down the corridor and I knew as soon as I saw him, that he was going to come to tell me that Glenn had the same genetic defect. I don't know why, I just knew. Um, and I felt quite sorry for Dr Moser, actually, the fact that he had to tell me um, that he had the same defect. It, it felt like, you know, your world has gone upside down again. Um, you, you, you just think everything's 
going again like when we were sold about Barry. OK, keep looking right at my finger. Right there. <laughs> we could lose two boys. We could lose two boys within 10 years. Push against me. Doctors had worked Push out there was a 50% chance that boys with the gene go on to develop the symptoms. That is when they made the decision that Glenn would go on the oil because of the emotional involvement, really, because, you know, we'd just been told about Barry. Um, it was awful. And with their advice, we, we put him on Lorenzo's oil. And I do believe he was the first non-symptomatic child to be put on it. Although reeling from this second blow, the Staffords did have the hope offered by Lorenzo's oil. The movie Lorenzo's Oil was released in 1992. It starred Nick Nolte, Peter Ustinov and Susan Sarandon, who was Oscar nominated for her role as Michaela. It showed a miracle cure, but in the time it took to make the movie, things had changed, and for the worse. The difficulty with the Hollywood version of Lorenzo's Oil is that it painted an extraordinarily optimistic outcome. The concluding sequences are of little boys saying, I'm on Lorenzo's oil and I'm now 10 years old and I'm absolutely fine. This is Charles, and this is Harry, and they've both been on Lorenzo's oil for two years. My name is Michael Benton and I'm 12 and a half years old. Yes. I've been taking Lorenzo's oil for four and a half years. This is my brother Gregory and my brother Chris. And you hear on the soundtrack Lorenzo speaking. His words I'm thinking will get outside my head. It was all a bit too optimistic for the scientific community to buy into, and they immediately uh, said that my father and my stepmother were making outrageous claims for the oil. Lovely film, absolutely wonderful film, but. I did have a problem because of the artistic license, really. My concern was that it would give out false hopes. I'd lived through um, having a child that was ill and all the pitfalls that that involved, and I was a little bit concerned that it would, it would make the Lorenzo's whole seem like that there was this miracle cure. It's not a miracle cure for those children that have started the illness, and I've proven that with Barry. Despite being on the oil, Barry Stafford had been getting progressively worse. I was having to get up in the morning and change him, dress him, undress him, wash him, um, feed him. Um, but not, couldn't feed him by mouth because he couldn't, so he had to be through the gastrostomy tube. We just had to do everything for him. There were times when, you know, you could just give up, but you can't. They're your kids, you know, you got to... Keep going. Cases like Barry's were giving doctors great cause for concern. After I saw the movie, I was indignant at the fact that the movie presented more hope than was justified. <laughs> In this particular childhood form of which Lorenzo is an example, uh, it is not only uh, that they didn't get better, but they continue to get worse uh, week by week. The popular press leapt on the failing, and medical journals around the world rubbished the oil. Although Lorenzo hadn't been cured by the oil, the Odonis thought that he had stabilized and that this offered hope for others. The oil somehow, to me, I was hoping that it was going to cure Lorenzo. But not long after it was discovered, I realized that it was not the cure. I, I listened, I, I heard the conversation and realized, oh, this is not the cure. But um, there was hope, big hope, that it's going to stop the progress of the disease, which I believe it did. Dr. Moser was not prepared to give up. 
He was convinced the oil was doing something beneficial because it was removing the long-chain fatty acids. There is a rational basis for thinking that it might work. <laughs> it lowers the level of the substance that may have an important role in causing the symptoms. So one would be terribly negligent, almost criminal, <laughs> and not to test it. So Dr. Moser started a scientific trial. Across Europe and the United States, he identified 120 boys with the ALD gene who had not yet started to develop the disease, like Glenn Stafford, and he put them on Lorenzo's oil. It would be many years before any results would be established, years which boys like Glenn's brother Barry didn't have. Glenn was terrific. Glenn was terrific with Barry. He would play with him. Um, he would sing to him. He would help to feed him. He would try and help to dress him. He'd done what he can. One time he came up to me and I was getting ready to go out and he just said, Mum, is Barry going to die? And I've always vowed that we wouldn't lie to him and I said, yes. And he went, oh, all right then, and walked away. But as far as the oil was concerned with Barry, Alfie and I had a chat about it and we actually took Barry off the oil. We both agreed that it wasn't really doing an awful lot for Barry. The oil probably slowed the process down a bit with Barry. But I wouldn't say that it was ever going to stop because the damage was so immense. By now, Barry was in and out of hospital and was having such serious fits that his parents decided they didn't want him kept alive on machines. He really was quite poorly, really, really was poorly. He had either a fit or something wasn't right, so all hell broke loose. And there was a doctor there that was going to, you know, was thinking about putting him on a, on a breathing machine, um, and we made sure that, no, there was no way we were going to do that because if it was Barry's turn to go, it was... So we were ushered out of the room and I just went to pieces, absolutely went to pieces. So they were all sorting him out and then they called us back. Obviously, Barry was dying um, and then me and Alfie was there. Me and Chris went in, into the room, held his hand and just said our goodbyes and he just passed away. But he died with his mum and dad there, so... <sighs> He's in my mind all the time. He's always here. I suppose every minute of day you always think of him. Yeah, he's, a, he's always there. He's always there. He's always at the back of your mind. It had become clear that for boys with advanced symptoms, Lorenzo's oil was not a cure. Doctors stopped prescribing it. Those living with ALD were once again left with no hope. For children like Alex Hunt, conventional medicine can still offer nothing. So Alex is taken to a healer. Take a deep breath and pull my arm. Come on, pull. I want to pull. I want to pull, like this. Pull all the way. His theory is that the mind knows how to do all these things still, and it's just a question of the mind instructing the brain and the body how to do it again. Getting yourself to heal yourself, I think, really. Well done, well done. 
Well done. Another one. When we first started out, they told me that Alex would slip in sort of like a vegetable, you know, coma. He wouldn't realise what's happening to him and all this sort of thing. And I thought at the time, that's probably for the best, that's really good, but I don't think that now. And I think he's definitely in there and it sort of like wants to communicate with us and you can just see it sometimes. See it. See it. See it. Take a deep breath and see it. Come on, see it. Try, try, try. Use your tongue, move your tongue. Move your tongue. Come on, try. Try, move your tongue. Try. Try, again. Go, my baby, go, try. Mm. Try. Come on, baby. Move your tongue and say it. Take a deep breath. I'm not going to pin all my hope on the healer because I still want a cure for it. Because, you know, Alex is just one child with ALD. And I think with with Mr. Regali, it will be a very long process. But I mean, if he, if Alex can be healed by that, then that's absolutely great. Come on, baby, try. Try. That's it, good boy, good boy. Pull, 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 pull my arm again. One more time. But I mean, I don't believe in putting all my eggs in one basket, so I'll keep doing fundraising for research. And if it's a, a race between the two, see who comes up with the cure for him first, isn't it? <laughs> 18, 20, 20. Okay, onto your side. You ready? Let's go. Sarah's left hoping for a cure for Alex. For now, all she can do is care for him with intensive physiotherapy. 31, 32. What is clear as far as Lorenzo's oil is concerned is that in children who have developed cerebral ALD, it appears to have no effect on the course of the condition. Alex, though, has a little brother. Hi, honey. Mom? Yes, I do. What do you want? Have you come to count with us? No. Can you what? Your train set? No, but you can play with it in your bedroom. If you want to make a mess, you make it in your bedroom, nowhere else. It won't make a mess. Oh. Yeah, right. When Aidan was a year old, he was found to have the faulty ALD gene too. And for him, Dr. Moses' trial of Lorenzo's oil was going to have an enormous impact. When we first went for the um, consultation with Dr. Velodi, he mentioned Lorenzo's oil, and he said that they used to, as part of the course, they would put every child with ALD on Lorenzo's oil, but then they felt that it wasn't really doing anything, so they stopped doing it because there were no research results and they couldn't do proper clinical trials. And then Dr. Hugo Moser was doing a clinical trial, and I think we were waiting for the waiting and waiting and waiting for the results. The results are finally through. Barry Stafford's brother, Glenn, is now 21. The first pre-symptomatic boy to trial the oil is free of the symptoms of ALD. If they hadn't caught the illness and put me on the oil, then I don't think I would be here now. No, I don't think I would. So it is due to the oil that I am here. You know, it helped me through the critical stage of the illness, I, I'd say. And Glenn was not alone. Across the world, other boys with the ALD gene were also escaping the disease. The results of the 10-year trial are remarkable. In some boys who haven't yet developed the symptoms of ALD, Lorenzo's oil actually helps to prevent it starting. Of 120 patients in the trial, 
83 remain free of symptoms. The patients who lowered their fatty acids very well reduced their chance of developing the severe disease by about 40 to 50 percent. <laughs> The oil has given boys like Glenn a whole new chance in life. I'd love to be in West End, I'd love to be in Broadway, I'd love to do all things like that. I don't care about fame or anything like that, I'd just rather be on stage, because that's when I feel, that's when I feel really at ease. Positive results like Glenn's in the prevention trial couldn't come soon enough for Sarah and her son, Aidan. At last, there was real hope. Finally, Dr. Velody phoned, I think, everybody on his list with ALD to sort of, like, say, yes, you can start taking Lorenzo's oil now. You can drink your oil up, please. Okay. There's a good boy. Remember why it's so important. I don't feel so bad about Aidan because I, don't, I think he'll be fine. You know, he takes Lorenzo's oil, there's preventative stuff, we've caught him early. So, you know, can't be that unlucky to us, can you? <laughs> this time round, the optimism about Lorenzo's oil is more realistic. It does have a remarkable effect, but as Glenn Stafford found, it's not easy to stick to the regime. It's combined with a very restrictive diet. When I was younger, I was only allowed something like 0.5 grams of fat, which is not a lot of foods around. So if I wanted something as a snack, I'd have to have fruit. You know, I'd have to have an apple or something like that. But then once again, if I had an apple, I couldn't have the skin, because the skin's very fatty. Even though your friends try not to, you do feel a bit of an outcast, because, you know, everyone's eating everything, and you're like, no, I'll have a bit of celery again, thanks. You know, it's just... I got an attitude towards it where I didn't want to take it, where, you know, got to the point where I was in school that my mum would put it there, walk off, and I'd tip it down sink, because I just looked at it and it just made me feel sick. Pretty disgusting. It looks like melted lard. It's all greasy, and it's yeah, horrible. Well, you know when you get really fatty food, but without the food? It is extremely unpleasant to take. Oh. That was horrible, Dad. Now that Glenn is 21, he's passed the highest risk period and has decided to come off the oil. I just knew I had enough, you know. The feeling of you knowing you've got to take it, the taste of it was horrible. Unless you've been through it, it's, for people to comment, it's very hard. I'm putting myself probably at a little bit more risk than anybody else in life, you know. Life's a risk, you know. Anything can happen. Like I've said before, you could walk out and get hit by bus. Although there may be a small risk of development of cerebral ALD, it is obviously much less than in early childhood. Glenn will always be living on eggshells. Always. Nobody knows what's going to happen. I don't want to mope around and cry about it. I don't want to. I don't want it to rule my life. You know. First and foremost, I'm Glenn Stafford. You know, my illness comes way down at the bottom of the heap. <laughs> For Glenn, Lorenzo's oil has given him the chance to pursue his dreams. And now other boys have a chance too. Aiden is on the oil, and his fatty acid levels have dropped to normal. His chances are looking excellent. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. He is carefully monitored to check that this doesn't change. There is now a conventional treatment if the oil fails, a complete bone marrow transplant. But this is highly risky and experimental. However, if the oil regime is strictly kept up, the chances of it working are even better. Because he's just turned four, then that's when things start to happen between the ages of four and ten, so you have to be really on your guard to see what's going on and make sure there's no behavioural changes, all the tests are up to date and everything. 
I'm packing because Aidan's going up north with his dad for a few days. We're waiting at the minute. Um, he had the scan at Guy's Hospital and they came back that there were some changes on it. He has a scan every six months and they compare one scan to the next. And if there's changes, then they have to ascertain whether those changes are normal development or whether they mean that ALD started and he'll have to go for the bone marrow transplant. So we're just waiting for um, verification from Dr. Velody as to what the changes actually mean. Half of you is thinking, well, it's probably just going to be developmental, but the other half is sort of like, you know, the fear-mongering half. Like, what if? Aidan's travelling up to Cumbria for a half-term break with his dad, who's now separated from Sarah. Back at Great Ormond Street, Dr. Velody takes Aidan's scans to a radiologist. And they have noticed some abnormalities that they're a bit concerned about. And essentially, they wanted to know whether these are typical of early cerebral ALD or whether they're just normal development and can be ignored. What you can see is that there are these areas of high signal in the parietal white matter where you can see changes of ALD. But if we compare them to the images of uh, six months ago... Ah, no, not the bump! Oh! <laughs> oh. oh my he's a proper little boy, a little monster. He's everything a little boy should be. You know, he's just full of fun and mischief. He's cheeky and loves to have a good time, and he just, uh, he's into everything. Yeah, very bright. You know, loves to learn. Let's go over there and hunt some dinosaurs. Come on, let's go and get them. <laughs> get <those> <laughs> I'm quite happy at the moment, really, because recently his blood levels were, for the first time, um, normal, and uh, doctors were quite happy with that, so that, that was uh, quite a boost. Because we know now that we're getting the balance between his oil right and his, his diet. Of course, every time he has a scan, I'm uh, a little bit on tenter hooks. I just kind of forget about it then, really, like, you know, until we get the result, try and put it to the back of my head, because you can overstress yourself worrying about things like that. Come in. Right, cheers. Right, Aidy. Hello, Aidan. <laughs> okay. Do you have a seat? How are okay. you? And how's Aidan? Oh, he's all right, yeah. Same as usual, really. Yeah. Yeah. He's been okay, yeah. His behaviour's still appalling, but I mean, I suppose <laughs> that's part of the course, isn't it? But yeah, he's fine, yeah. Nothing untoward or different in the last six months? No, no. no. Not that I can pinpoint, no. And how school will find? Yeah, they're fine, yeah. That's good. They haven't noticed anything. Apart from his behaviour, no. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, you know he had his MRI scan at Guy's. Um, yeah. We got the films over and got our radiologist to have a look at them. And I'm delighted to be able to tell you that right. they're all fine. Well, that's a relief, yeah. So uh, we'll just repeat them as usual in about six months. OK, and you can be absolutely sure I'm just... Just because it was developmental, I that, do get a bit worried. That's how right, it is. Difference. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's all there is to it. Yeah. It's no evidence of AOD. Right, okay. And um, yeah, so we just repeat them in six months. Brilliant. Thank you, Aidan. You can say bye bye, Aidan. Bye bye. Bye. I think that it's a shame that the medical profession tried to put down Lorenzo's oil for so long, really. I mean, I understand that the medical profession has to be reserved about things, but if you've got something that can't be treated by any other means, then what is the problem with, with trying something that has been proven in some cases? At the age of seven, Lorenzo was given only two years to live. He is now 25. He remains in a stable condition. And then that will come, okay? Okay, now stay here, play with him. Hey, Lorenzo, he's got the new one, He's the cheering guy, you know. 
I talked to Lorenzo as if I, you know, I was talking to him a long time ago in the Comoros. I, as long as he is with us, uh, my main objective is to, to keep pain from him, that uh, I don't want him to have any pain. I think that when I look at Lorenzo, I never doubt that he is absolutely to be preserved and to be cherished, and that he understands that cherishing, that he feels it. The fundamental is feeling the love and, and expressing that love, even if it's just moving your finger. The struggle against ALD took its toll on the whole Odoni family. Michaela died three years ago. Sadly, she never knew the full results of the trial. But as non-scientists and against all the odds, the Odonis achieved an extraordinary medical breakthrough, inspired by their son every step of the way. Augusto has never given up trying to cure Lorenzo completely. He's working on a partnership with top scientists, including Dr. Moser. Hi, Hugo. He hopes one day to repair Lorenzo's brain by restoring the myelin, the nerve covering that is damaged by ALD. Anna told me that after the meeting, the PMD meeting, you're off to Cairo. Yes, yes. My gosh, I really admire you. My father generates such electricity when he walks into one of those Milan Project conferences because all the scientists know that this is the man who's going to break their back if they don't work fast enough for him. But at the same time, they know that he's the man who will raise the funds to make their experiments possible. The Milan Project is the vehicle with which he hopes to reach his ultimate destination, which is the restoration of Lorenzo's faculties. Augusto's aiming for a breakthrough that would not only help ALD patients like Lorenzo and Alex, but also millions of people suffering from other degenerative nerve disorders. We raise a lot of money for the Milan Project. I think that they'll be the ones that find the cure if anybody. I think the Adonis are fantastic for what they did. They really are fantastic. In the midst of this dark and gloomy tragedy, my father's strength of conviction and his almost foolhardy determination to make it work was the kind of the lifeline in this story. Yeah. I don't think the words give up are in my dad's vocabulary. If you have been affected by any of the issues in tonight's program and would like to talk to someone in confidence for details of further support and information, please call the BBC Action Line on 0800 888 809.